Today, I'm going to walk you through six mistakes I made while working as a structural engineer, plus a few blunders I've seen my colleagues make. Some were silly mistakes from my early days, while others were just simple oversights. And stick around to the end because I've got five lessons to share that can really change the game for you. The first mistake was a refurbishment to a quite old building made of brick and concrete. I was tasked to engineer a suspended walkway between two separate areas of the building. The structure of the walkway itself was pretty straightforward. However, I had to check if the existing reinforced concrete beams of this old building were strong enough to take the extra load from the steel beams supporting the walkway. I crunched the numbers for the minimum reinforcement required. I checked shear, bending and deflection. It was all good except that I was checking the rebars as if they were 500 MPa huge stress. I overlooked the fact that the building was constructed in the 80s, if I can recall correctly, and the reinforcement huge stress was actually 410 MPa back then. And if you look into the history of Australian reinforcing bars, you will notice that some years, reinforcement bars yield stress could get as low as 230 MPa, which reduces a lot their capacity compared to the 500 MPa that we have nowadays. Thankfully, my manager caught the mistake and we adjusted the calculations in time. Next up was a site inspection oversight. We designed a three meters retaining wall pinned by a slab at the top. And if you're specifying a pinned wall, you must temporarily prop it until the slab have been poured and achieved strength. We detailed the props on the drawings so it wasn't like our mistake, but when I did the inspection, I was inspecting everything else and didn't realize the wall was not propped. And at the time, the slab had not been poured yet. I took heaps of photos and luckily my workmate was looking at the photos and asked me, shouldn't that wall be propped until the slab is poured? And I was, <laughs> I called the guys on site straight away and asked them to prop the wall immediately. In this case, the soil was holding itself up very well, but we never know what could have happened with a heavy rain or any sort of accidental surcharge to the wall. By the way, if you want to know more about this, there is a link in the description of this video for my Retaining Walls Design ebook where I teach you all of that. Honestly, it's the easiest to follow material for retaining wall design you will ever find anywhere. So check that out. Now on to a mistake from one of my co-workers. He designed a cornerless door in a beautiful modern house with a massive open plan living area with raked ceiling. It's funny because I designed something very similar for a client this week. So I went to a site for a structural inspection and the builder was saying the doors were flappy and moving too much. I looked at the drawings and quickly realized the lintels were not big enough to spend laterally as a wing beam. It worked for the vertical loads, but if you pushed it sideways, it would move. And this would be even more problematic if the house was in a high speed wind region. To resolve this issue, we replaced the jump studs with a steel column running all the way up to the ceiling diaphragm and laminated another feather timber beam to the lintel. On a side note, ideally the best section to use as a wind beam for long spans is a steel hollow section. RHS and SHS work very well for bending in both axes, so if you come across something like that, consider using a steel hollow section for the wind beam. Number four is another inspection oversight on my end. I was inspecting the footings of a two-story house. There were strip footings spanning between screw piles. I checked the depth, the width, the reinforcement, cover, lapping lengths, corner bars, everything looked great. I wrote the inspection report, 
took heaps of photos and went back to the office. What I didn't realize was that a couple of screw piles had been installed off center to the footing. They were offset by more than 100 millimeters and I didn't pick that up. Luckily, my workmate was looking at the photos I took and he noticed these spots where it didn't look quite right. To resolve this problem, we run a couple of strip footings perpendicular to these piles to tie back in the eccentric footings. If you'd like to understand more about that, you can watch a video of mine called out of position piles and how to fix them. Now a classic rookie mistake. I'm putting it out here in this video just in case, but you're smarter than me and I'm sure you would never make this mistake. I was tasked with designing a column removal in a garage. There was the central column at the garage door, which was annoying, and the owner of the house wanted to remove it. The garage walls were made of concrete blocks, so I designed a steel beam to span between the walls. For the connection, I designed two camset bolts to the block. I also wrote a column removal procedure to instruct the builder on how to prop the existing beam and remove the column. After I finished my calculations, I sent it to my senior engineer to review the design. And at the time, it was very obvious to him that the connection would not work at all. He asked me to redo the camset bolts fixings. I did the calculations again and got the same results. I asked him to show me how he does it. And two seconds in, I realized that I was not considering edge distances in my design which is probably the first and most important parameter in camset calculations. So that was a bit embarrassing. If no one had reviewed my design, I would probably have caused a catastrophic failure. So yeah, I'm glad I had good people around me, but that was embarrassing to say the least. And lastly, a design choice that proved problematic. The sixth mistake was on a cantilevered block work wall picking up three levels of concrete floor. If you look at this plan, this wall stops here at the ground floor and it cantilevers on the first and second floor. I was designing the block walls to cantilever and pick up three levels of concrete floor. The numbers stacked up and I had designed cantilever block walls before, which was fine. But my colleague at the time pointed out the challenge he had with guys on site trying to build something like that and it was also very hard to inspect. And I completely agree, especially for 2.3 meters cantilever picking up three stories. You probably don't want to rely on block walls for that, so we decided to design a cantilever reinforced concrete beam which would be easier to build and also to inspect on site. So here are a couple of lessons that I would like you to get from this video. Lesson number one, yes, we need to provide a cost effective design, but to me, the most important part of structural engineering is a safe design. Structural engineering is not an easy profession and I want to sleep at night. So to me, safety always comes first. Lesson number two, take ownership of your mistakes. Learn from them and move on. Don't dwell on it, nor try to blame someone else. Lesson number three, transparency is key. Don't sweep mistakes under the rug. Address them head on, even if it means spending a bit of more time and money to fix them. And lesson number four, build strong relationships with your managers and partners. You never know when you will need their support. And if you are a manager, be supportive and understanding with your team. You never know what's going on in their lives. And lesson number five, respect the folks on the ground. Builders and contractors play a crucial role in bringing or designs to life. So treat them with respect they deserve. They are the ones who will clean up your mess if you do something wrong. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you want to know more about steel portal frame design, watch this video next and I'll see you there.